safety target and which our independent advisors, the Committee on Climate Change, recognised as going above and beyond what would require the Scotland's proportionate share of the Paris commitment. So secondly also is the way we report upon these targets. So our targets are actually annual targets that we report to Parliament on every single year. And that's a little bit different from the framework used across the UK as a whole, which kind of focuses around multi-year carbon budgets. So quite a prescriptive monitoring of that target. The mechanism we use to, to pull information together and to coordinate policy action in government is called our climate change plan. And that plan was published first last in 2018. However, when we updated the legislation and, and uh, the new targets, we um, updated that plan in December of 2020. And we refreshed it so that it was commensurate with the targets that we had with over 100 new policies and proposals um, uh, aligned with the uh, targets and the, and the trajectory of emissions reduction required. Now, the way our plan works is it takes a sector by sector approach. So the chart that I've got in the slide shows, shows the kind of breakdown of that. Um, by sector, what I mean are things like transport, industry, electricity. And that's what you can see in the chart. And in order to deliver emissions reductions in, in our targets, each of the sectors in the climate change plan has been inside an envelope, or a, we call it an envelope, but effectively an emissions reduction pathway. And these envelopes are not sector by sector statutory targets, but they give policymakers a guide in terms of the emissions reduction effort required and accountability for the policies that are designed in those, in those sectors. Now, for a bit of context there, CCS in itself is not a sector in our plan, it actually, but it, but it is integral and, uh, integral and critical for all of the industry sector decarbonisation efforts, the electricity sector decarbonisation efforts, and also the, the, the chart you see below the baseline there, um, which is actually increasing use of negative emission technologies or greenhouse gas removal technologies, which our plan does, does rely on. So I'll maybe dive a couple, bit deeper into a couple of those sectors just to, just to unpack it a bit. So if you go into the next slide, Jamie. I'll talk through some of our plans for industry. Now, industrial emissions in Scotland account for about 30% of our total emissions. Now, these emissions predominantly come from manufacturing sectors, energy intensive industries, some of the mining, construction, and a number of other kind of high priority areas. These are fundamental to the Scottish economy and employ about more than 300,000 people in what are generally highly skilled and highly paid jobs. That's therefore the kind of foundation of what we are doing in much of the policy and industrial decarbonisation is centred around just transition. So in Scotland, we established a just transition commission to advise us on some of the policies required to implement this transition. It can be reported uh, earlier this year with a, with a range of different recommendations and our incoming government, um, which was elected in May, um, has agreed and committed to take on board all of the recommendations from that just transition report including things like the commitment to bring forward just transition plans, charting the transition of sites, industries, regions, and communities. So the work Mike's gonna talk about today and the nexus are leading on is gonna be really critical for some of that work. And we've got a new just transition minister in Richard Lockhead that is designed, that is coming into post with uh, going to lead some of this work for us and, and, and oversee some of the, the, the activity we're doing. I guess policy and industry though, is traditionally be considered one of those hard to treat sectors no easy silver bullet um, decarbonisation options. And that's been the, the kind of background to some of the decarbonisation options. However, we've seen real development in that in recent years. Um, and the CCPU, in recognising this developments coming forward, commits to taking a really sequenced and strategic approach to decarbonising indust our industrial sectors, not pushing forward at a pace that's going to see offshoring of emissions or, de uh, or decarbonisation by deindustrialisation. We want to bring forward the technologies and the processes and the, the investment that will decarbonise those sectors and keep the activity here in Scotland. Um, therefore, some of the key work we've been doing around things like our hydrogen policy statement, which is intricately connected with our CCS ambitions, um, really drew out some of that, that thinking. If you move on to electricity now, Jamie. So electricity is another sector where CCS has a really important role to play. Um, with the electricity sector in Scotland, you've, you've really got to look at this through two lenses. Firstly, the significant progress that's been made in already moving to a very low carbon system. In Scotland, over 97% of the electricity we consume in Scotland now comes from renewable sources, which is a really significantly low carbon grid. However, the targets that I mentioned earlier require us to move from that low carbon generation system to a zero carbon system over the course of this decade, and also in a way 
that actually allows a system resilience and security um, and the potential to connect some of these negative emissions technologies to it. And by negative emissions technologies, I mean things like um, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, direct air capture that are required to actually take us towards the net zero targets. And we actually need to develop some of these technologies and bring them forward over the course of this decade and early into next. And our plan actually sees significant levels of nets over five megatons by the early part of next decade. And that's why it's also really encouraging to see the work with um, SSE are leading and Peter Head CCS, um, also connected with the, the, the projects we're going to discuss today, because that is a, a, a would take our, one of our remaining fossil fuel stations and, and, and uh, replace that with a, a new carbon capture and storage uh, system that could be really quite, um, that would bring that much lower emissions down. And just to draw out a few of our policy ambitions around some of this, um, the next slide talks through some of the priorities that we've set in Scottish Government. So as a starting point, our policy on CCS very much aligns with what the Committee on Climate Change have recommended, and that they see uh, CCS as being critical, a critical part of the transition to net zero. And in fact, moreover than that, in our modelling for the Climate Change Plan, we could not find a technically feasible route to our net zero targets without the deployment of CCS in Scotland. Therefore, some of the policies we're bringing forward as part of the climate change plan and elsewhere are, are enabling this. So along with our, our um, CCPU, one of the things we published was our hydrogen policy statement, which committed to both Scotland deploying five gigawatts of both green and blue hydrogen um, combined by 2030, which is a significant ambition of deployment in Scotland. And to support that, we've introduced new funding schemes. Um, we launched an Emerging Energy Technologies Fund with £180 million of funding over the next five years, and also a smaller, more targeted pot of funding on looking at um, carbon capture utilisation with a view of trying to pump prime and encourage some of the capture and use of CO2 in our manufacturing clusters. And we recognise that there's still a lot to understand and learn around things like the use of bioenergy and negative emissions technologies. So we are, we've committed to do some significant feasibility work and understanding all of the key sustainability issues around the use of bioenergy with carbon capture. And I guess the key thing to get across here is the design principle in our policies here is to ensure that the support and the, the policies we are bringing forward are complementary to those that have been developed across the UK as a whole. So the UK are leading some significant pieces of work just now in developing business models for carbon capture and hydrogen deployment and things like the cluster sequencing process, which we'll hear about today, which I think are going to be really important in, in getting the, these uh, technologies and projects up to scale. And our design principle and our funding and our policies is to, is to um, design them in a way that is complementary to those UK wide regulatory mechanisms. And just to finish, Jamie, on the, on the last slide, just want to touch a little bit on opportunities and ambition. Um, now, I think I've looked, talked a lot so far about how we see CCS as having a really important role in our net zero targets. I think we actually see Scotland as having some really significant advantages, both natural and economic, in developing a CCS sector. Now, I won't plan to go into these in much depth just now due to time, and I also think Mike is going to take us through some of these in a bit more detail. So I'll leave that for Mike, but I also want to just say that um, along with our natural and economic advantages, I think the, the development of CCS in Scotland has really strong alignment with some of our policy ambitions. Some of the wider work we are doing around industrial transition and industrial cluster development working with the Grangemouth cluster, working with retrofitting our existing energy intensive industries is really aligned with the development of a CCS sector in Scotland. And I think one of the things I'd like to see coming out of, of the project development over the next few years is real greater collaboration between our industrial clusters and some of these projects. And finally, I think as we head towards COP26 in Glasgow in November, the Scottish Government is really keen to maximise the opportunity that all of this presents. We have energy policy as one of our key themes that we want to shout about during COP. Um, and I don't want to stray too far into the work that uh, Mike and Kirsty are going to talk about just now, but I think the, the work that these organisations are progressing in things like Scotland's Net Zero Roadmap and Scotland's Net Zero Infrastructure Projects is the exact type of thing we want to see and champion as part of that process. So I think I'll, I'll pause there, Mike, and, and um, hopefully that gives you a good overview of, of um, SG policy in this space. Excellent. Well, Thank you, Andy. Really great to learn more about Scotland's uh, net zero commitment and, and ambition there in the background. Obviously, a, a lot going on, uh, a lot going on at this time. Um, 
a quick question for you before we we pass across to to Mike. Um, the Scottish government have responded very quickly to the establishment of the the Climate Change Act 2019. CCS is clearly important to the delivery of net zero by 2045. Um, can you comment on the role of CCS in meeting the interim targets of a 75% reduction by 2030 and a 90% reduction by 2040? Yes, yes, happy to. So it's, I guess there's a couple of parts to that. There's, there's the pace part about responding quickly and then also the role of CCS. And I think on, on pace, that's something we recognise is really important. So, I mean, it's not that long ago our First Minister declared a climate emergency back in April 2019. We moved quite quickly from there to enshrining and gaining royal assent for our Climate Change Act. And actually from that, realised that targets are not, targets do not solve the problem. You need delivery and actions and policies. So actually, as part of the, once the act was in place, government itself committed quite quickly to bringing forward our climate change plan update. We didn't wait the five year cycle we were intending to. We brought it forward and updated that in December of last year. And I think in terms of the role CCS plays in that, and particularly for the 2030 target, I think it's really important. So I mentioned briefly in the presentation that the Committee on Climate Change recognised that um, our 2030 target was, was above and beyond and faster than what they would have recommended as a proportionate share of Scotland's contribution to the Paris Agreement. Um, and I think that's right. Um, but in, in identifying that, and in the base tells as part of the six carbon budget, the CCC pointed out several areas that uh, they identified that if we're going to meet that enhanced target and in that enhanced pace, particularly over the period of 2030, we're going to have to go faster. And the four areas the CCC identified were bringing forward and advancing uh, the start of the commencement of greenhouse gas removals faster potentially than the UK will as a whole and, 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 other, and other regions as well. Early decarbonisation of the Grangemouth cluster, which is our largest industrial cluster and accounts for well over two megatons of emissions. Um, accelerated scrappage of high carbon assets, things like um, existing boilers or even or, or in the transport sector, existing cars. Um, and increased rollout of heat decarbonisation were the four areas with a particular focus on sort of hybrid heat pumps. So of those four areas that the CCC recommended we need to do more, more quickly, two of them rely heavily on CCS. The first two, greenhouse gas removals and Grangemouth decarbonisation are integral with CCS. So I think in terms of CCS's role, it's, it's really central to achieving those targets, we believe. That's great. Thanks very much, Andy. Really appreciate your insight there. We'll, we'll return um, to you at the end of today's session with some of the audience uh, members' questions. But for now, let's uh, move on. Let's move across to Mike Smith, who's going to tell us a little bit more about Scotland's net zero roadmap. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Jamie, and uh, thanks for the opportunity today. Uh, yes, I'm here to talk about uh, Scotland's net zero roadmap. Uh, that's one of uh, six roadmaps that are currently being developed across the UK. Uh, those roadmaps are based in the largest industrial clusters, uh, as identified by the UK government. Uh, and uh, all six of those roadmaps are partly being funded uh, by uh, our government funding body, uh, UKRI, Innovate UK. Uh, and here in Scotland, uh, that uh, industry, that funding is being matched by industry. Uh, and you can see on the screen there, uh, the uh, industrial players who are supporting this roadmap uh, and providing direct funding uh, for the project. Uh, and they represent some of the largest uh, industrial players across Scotland, uh, some of them key infrastructure owners, uh, and indeed some of the bodies who will have a hand in some of the regulation of this as we move forward. So we're very pleased to have them on board and supporting us. And whilst Nexus, as the uh, Scottish Association for Industrial Decarbonisation, is leading the project, uh, we couldn't deliver it on our own. We have a fantastic group of partners, and you can see the project partners listed on the bottom of this slide. Uh, those partners uh, represent some of the leading academic groups in Scotland. Uh, they represent some of the leading research and technology organisations, uh, some of the existing uh, project developers in this space, uh, and also some of the leading uh, supply chain and technology organizations uh, that are delivering uh, industrial decarbonization projects across the globe as we speak. Uh, but if I move to the next slide, um, what I want to start with before we even think about developing a roadmap for a large industrial area such as uh, Scotland, 
we need to first think about what strengths can you lean into in that roadmap? You know, you want to always take advantage of the natural strengths that you might have. And we're fortunate in Scotland that we have several key strengths, and I'm going to step through those one by one. Uh, the first of those strengths is largely a legacy of both our rich industrial heritage, uh, but also uh, the significant amount of uh, oil and gas exploration and development that has occurred in the past. Um, we have significant amounts of existing infrastructure. That infrastructure can be repurposed and reused, and it includes multiple onshore pipelines and multiple offshore pipelines, as you see on the screen, as well as a significant amount of, uh, of existing deep water port infrastructure, where those deep water ports can use, um, have experience and currently use large liquefied products such as LPG, and therefore could potentially have the uh, operational capability uh, to transit to other large liquefied mediums such as CO2 and hydrogen. And it's important to have this infrastructure and it's important to have multiple uh, redundancies within the infrastructure because the hard reality is whilst we are developing CO2 and hydrogen infrastructure, uh, we will need to maintain the existing uh, natural gas grid for many years to come. So having multiple lines and having some of those lines that are coming to the end of their useful life for natural gas allows them us to reuse and repurpose them. The second strength that you've seen built on the screen there uh, and that was already alluded to by Andy is Scotland has, uh, for the UK as a whole, by far the largest CO2 storage potential. Uh, the British Geological Survey identified across the whole of the United Kingdom continental shelf approximately 70 gigatons of storage potential. 65% <clears throat> of that is in Scottish waters. Uh, and so that represents a huge opportunity both to Scotland, but also to the rest of the UK and ultimately to the rest of Europe to provide a CO2 storage management resource that can be utilized more widely. If you build uh, to the next point, which complements quite nicely the CO2 storage potential, and that's the fact that uh, Scotland also is seeing one of the largest build outs of uh, renewable energy, uh, again, as Andy has, has highlighted, uh, and we are going to see significant build outs of offshore wind potential over the coming years. Uh, they're highlighted in the hatched uh, areas that you see on the screen. And that's a mixture of approximately six gigawatts of uh, offshore wind that is currently under some sort of consenting or planning process, and a further eight that is potentially up for planning uh, and permitting in the near future. That offshore wind potential allows us to significantly increase our renewable electrification. But also that offshore wind is potentially in the right kind of places and is primed for, for us to utilize for green hydrogen, which could complement blue hydrogen and start to build out that hydrogen economy that we'd like to see developed across Scotland and the rest of the UK. To do all of that, we need a workforce. And we're fortunate again in Scotland that we have a large and highly skilled workforce uh, from our industrial heritage and also from oil and gas that we can redeploy. Uh, they have the skills, they have the manufacturing capability, uh, and they have the technological IP that we can redeploy into CCS. Uh, and we also have some of the leading academic groups uh, that have led uh, the academic research into carbon capture and storage uh, for many years, and they happen to be based in Scotland, including the newly announced uh, Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre that is based at Heriot Watt, just outside of Edinburgh. And because of all of that, the last point that we have in terms of our strengths is we have a multitude of ongoing projects. And those projects cover multiple elements of what we might need uh, if we are to ultimately uh, achieve net zero. Uh, so I won't go through those projects in detail, but I simply wanted to highlight they cover, as well as uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, they cover also the utilization of CO2, uh, greenhouse gas removal technologies such as direct air capture, and multiple projects around both blue and green hydrogen, with blue hydrogen being hydrogen from uh, steam methane reformation, green hydrogen being via electrolysis. All of that coupled together, we believe allows us to deliver on the significant uh, ambitious targets that Scotland has uh, and deliver decarbonisation for industry at, at pace in a scalable manner and one that is highly effective for industrial needs. So those strengths lead into our, our next slide, which is starting to look at, so with those strengths, what is the obvious area for us to focus on if we think about decarbonizing a large industrial cluster? Uh, and we have focused effectively on the east coast of Scotland. Uh, it's a region that, that uh, covers 
some 80% of all of Scotland's industrial emissions. Uh, they account in aggregate for about 9 million tonnes of CO2. And it's a region that goes from Lothian in the south of Scotland up to Aberdeenshire. Uh, we, in that region, have identified uh, 28 large industrial sites. Uh, we've also identified three key subclusters uh, that represent the vast majority of the 9 million tonnes of CO2 per annum that we're trying to address. And those subclusters are in Aberdeenshire, uh, in the Fife region and down in Grangemouth. Uh, and those 28 sites also cover multiple industries. And that's really important when you think about developing a coherent and integrated uh, roadmap for net zero because different industries will lean into different technological solutions and at different uh, scales and at different levels of pace. So by looking at multiple industries across this region, we believe that overall, we can deliver something that is practical and investable, uh, whilst recognizing that there is potentially multiple pathways. So we will be considering the different scenarios that could help us to achieve this net zero roadmap. So that's the area that we're thinking about. Uh, I'm now gonna cover a couple of the main parts of our roadmap thinking and how they will all come together uh, to build a roadmap overall. And the first one of those is to think about the technologies that we might need to deploy. So on the next slide, uh, we cover that technology deployment. Uh, some of our partners are working very closely uh, on this as we speak. Um, we did a pre-development uh, exercise in uh, the summer of last year where we went out to some of the main stakeholders. We did a large uh, stakeholder engagement exercise to look at across those sites, what sort of technological pathways might they be wishing to use to delve into uh, for their own sites to achieve net zero on a site basis. Uh, you can see that on uh, the right, on the left-hand side of the screen. Obvious candidates, uh, hydrogen fuel switching, uh, carbon capture and storage, potentially the utilization of CO2, greater electrification, and indeed uh, uh, greenhouse gas removal technologies are all seen as having potential. Unsurprisingly, therefore, we are looking at screening all of those technologies, looking at what technologies are deployable today, looking at what disruptive technologies could come along in the time frame between now and 2045, which is when Scotland has to achieve net zero, and how they can be rolled out and more and in Increasingly importantly, looking at the technology uh, cost pathways that we see for each of these when we look at the deployment of a learning curve and also the deployment of a, uh, a cost reduction curve as you scale up the deployment of these technologies. So that helps us to think about the technologies that might be used and also how those technologies could change over time. The next factor is then to think about how those technologies can be applied on a site by site basis. Each site is unique. And if we look at the next slide, we need to recognize the unique fact uh, aspects of each site. We also need to recognize that uh, if you think across some of the key industrial sectors, each sector has multiple options when it comes to its own journey to net zero. And therefore, each individual industrial site is likely to have multiple options. And therefore, we are very likely to see a sequence of decarbonizing investments that move any particular site from its current emissions today to net zero, ideally ahead of the national target of 2045. You can see on the screen there some of the options that are available. And what we are doing is trying to dig into uh, the information that has been shared with us by those sites around uh, their, the options that they have to develop high level concept engineering uh, you know, ideas for each of those options, look at the costings, phasings and execution plans for those so that we can develop at a site by site basis, a pathway to net zero. But if you have the sites understood and if the technology is understood, there's still a fundamental question that needs to be answered. And that's addressed on the last uh, sort of major theme that we are looking at in our roadmap, which is how you integrate all of this together. And on the next slide, we look at how we do that. And our chosen tool is to develop a net zero NG system model. This will be a live dynamic modeling tool. Uh, it will be based on some of the tools that are currently uh, in use across the UK and in Scotland at a national level but it will be uh, done at a far more refined level down to the kind of work that you need to look at on a site-by-site -site basis. Uh, our net zero energy system model is looking at three key modules. Unsurprisingly, there's a, the, our first module is the industrial site module. What industrial processes need to be decarbonized, what on-site energy assets are available, what new infrastructure needs to be built inside the fence, 
and therefore what how those pathways to net zero could be developed for the site itself. But the site doesn't live in isolation. And therefore we are then closely coupling that industrial site module to an infrastructure module. It's no good capturing carbon at an industrial site if you don't have a mechanism to transport and store that carbon. Nor is it uh, very worthwhile uh, doing a fuel switching solution to hydrogen if hydrogen isn't available on your doorstep. So the infrastructure module integrates all of the industrial site needs, checks that those needs are uh, can be uh, de delivered both locally, but also rationalize them against the resources available in the national energy system and at a national level, and looks at therefore what the optimal infrastructure could be around great electrification, around developing a hydrogen network, and crucially for CCS, around developing a CO2 transport and storage uh, network. And then lastly, with those th things understood, we recognize that whilst we are focused on industrial decarbonization, there is likely to be a significant opportunity through the activities happening at industrial sites and the infrastructure that's developed to support them to decarbonize other portions of the, of the economy. And in particular, we see that there will be regional solutions that could be put in place and co-investment could be made that allows those solutions to be used in areas such as uh, you know, domestic and commercial heating and heavy goods transportation. And whilst we won't be going too, de too detailed into how those individual uh, solutions could be deployed, we do think that a net zero energy system model will be a great way of identifying where those obvious synergistic opportunities exist. And all of that's going to be done across multiple scenarios because we do not have a single pathway to net zero and we need to test different choices, different levels of, uh, of adoption of hydrogen, of electrification, of CCUS. And that is going to be the test that we throw in as a set of scenarios into the energy system model itself. So on our last slide, to summarize the work that we're doing, in essence, uh, our roadmap, and in many ways, the roadmaps that are happening elsewhere across the UK, are trying to go from the site level problem to the regional roadmap solution, and to find ways and pathways to optimize that solution. So <clears throat> I've described that uh, at the moment, we're involved it's significantly in emitter engagement. Uh, we are roughly six months into a 24 month exercise to develop this roadmap. We expect to have uh, some of the uh, early phase uh, solutions from our net zero uh, energy system model uh, by, the, by Q2 of next year. Uh, and ultimately, we will be outputting the scenarios, testing those scenarios as to what is most practical and most economic, and then refining those, the, the scenarios that pass that initial test to try and deliver something that has been optimized for Scotland. And by doing that, hopefully create pathways and solutions that could be leveraged outside of Scotland. Thank you. Excellent. Well, Mike, thank you very much for your uh, insightful presentation. It's, it's great to learn more about the thinking behind Scotland's uh, net zero roadmap. Really helpful. Um, Mike, I'm interested in understanding a little bit more about what happens beyond the roadmap? How might Scotland contribute to the, the decarbonisation of other parts of the UK, other parts of Europe, potentially the world? Do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I, the, I think there are some real opportunities for Scotland. And um, you know, if you think back to those uh, natural strengths that we have and leaning into those strengths, uh, you know, we have great opportunity, I think, in Scotland uh, to look at uh, exporting hydrogen, so shipping hydrogen out of the region to regions where it, they might not have the natural uh, you know, strengths that allow them to produce that cost effectively. Uh, and we have a massive opportunity uh, to import uh, CO2. We have the port infrastructure, you know, we have the, uh, the, the pipeline and terminal infrastructure that can be redeployed to allow that to be built, but also scaled up very rapidly. Uh, and we have the geology. And yeah, it's very telling. Um, there are six large clusters across the UK that are, that are looking at roadmaps alongside the one that we're doing for Scotland. Um, the, th the, the three main regions uh, south of the Mersey don't have any natural stores. It's going to be very hard for them to achieve net zero if they ultimately can't transport the, the CO2 that they capture to a large area with storage potential, such as Scotland. So that's one particular area. The other area where I think we can help is um, because of some of those natural strengths, I think Scotland will be one of the first areas to start to build this out at scale. 
And how that can help on a global basis is we're likely to see some of the first steps towards the standardization of components, the modularization of some of these solutions. And that is a fantastic opportunity on a global basis. Yeah, if, if we can do that, if, and if by doing that, we can drive down the cost of deployment and we can make these something that an industrial site can do on a sort of off the shelf basis where these modules have been manufactured, you know, rather than fabricated, I think there's a fantastic opportunity for us to lead the way and the rest of the globe to follow. Absolutely. I think uh, standardization can be very helpful to help drive down costs. That's great. Lovely. Well, thank you, Mike. We'll uh, return to you with uh, some of the audience uh, questions at the end. Um, let's now move across to Kirsty, who is going to tell us a little bit more about the ACORN project. Over to you, Kirsty. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, so today I'm gonna to do just a really brief introduction to the ACORN project. And it's really just building on some of the points that you've heard already from Andy and from Mike. Um, so you heard from my introduction that I've been working in low carbon energy. Actually, I've been totting up. It's, it's actually over 12 years now um, and with a number of CCS projects internationally as well. So it's just really exciting now to be focusing on project delivery for a real project and all the ups and downs that come with that. And at the moment, I have to say there are more ups than downs. So if you can flick forward, Jamie. Um, I just think it is really an incredibly exciting time to be working in CCS in the UK and particularly in Scotland. Um, I've lived through a number of false dawns and disappointments for this technology in the UK, but the change that I've seen since I started working at Pale Blue Dot back in 2018 really has been quite incredible. And I think the significance of that 2019 Climate Change Act and the policies that you heard a bit about earlier from, from Andy really shouldn't be underplayed. And for that international audience that's listening, um, the, the importance of those policies in, in helping um, create a framework to allow a CCS to actually become a reality in, in our country is, is really is critical. Um, also, along with statements like you can see on the slide from the UK uh, Committee on Climate Change, and, and there was some reports being released yesterday and today that have, have updated these, and still that commitment um, really is there across the board in the UK, which is which is really exciting. And it's it goes alongside this social and political environment that we're working in, just being markedly different um, in a really good way. But... I have to say, I'm also really proud that the ACORN project that I'm going to talk about, and you're going to have to excuse my pun here, but it's rooted in learning from those past projects. So the ones that I mentioned where, you know, we've, we have had challenges in the past and CCS has really struggled in the UK to, to get a foothold. But there is a huge amount of learning, um, both intellectually, but also of, of reuse of infrastructure and, and some of the... Um, the work that's been done um, in, on these past projects is, is all you can see it injected um, in this project and in other, other projects that are happening across the UK now as well. Um, first, just let me explain who's involved in ACORN. If you don't mind moving on, Jamie. Thanks. So Stariga, who's the company that I work for, through wholly owned subsidiary Pale Blue Dot Energy, are the lead project developers for ACORN. And that's alongside our project partners, Shell and Harbour Energy. And the project also has received um, industry match funding, um, development support from both the UK, European and Scottish governments. Now, I live in a, a really small village in Scotland and I quite often hear the phrase that it takes a village to raise a good child. Well, in our case with ACORN, it takes a whole cluster to raise a good ACORN project. If you don't mind moving on, um, Jamie, that'd be great. And this is just a, a screenshot of the Scottish cluster web page, and it shows just some of the organisations that are showing their support for the creation of a Scottish cluster of industries, communities, businesses, all working together to deliver CCS, hydrogen and other low carbon technologies as well all to help Scotland, the UK and Europe to meet its, our net zero goals. And the ACORN project basically provides the backbone CCS and hydrogen infrastructure for the Scottish cluster. Right now, we are um, in absolute 
depths of a really busy period just preparing a bid for UK government's cluster sequencing um, competition. It's a bidding process and that's it's massively exciting. There's a, a lot of change going on um, and a lot of uh, emitters and different uh, people are coming um, to the party and really getting behind this idea of a cluster. And I, I think it's an interesting area because if you've been involved in CCS in the past, where, where we came from was really working on, you know, point source emissions. So one great big power station and trying to capture its CO2 and deal with it. Whereas now, the, the, certainly in the UK, the shift has really, it's really shifted to this focus on this much more, um, this cluster approach and this whole system approach that you heard from Mike. And I think it has made a, it's made a huge difference in terms of, the sort of the financing and just the entire approach to, to where CCS can make a difference um, and really positioning it in, in the place that it always should have been as a, as a climate mitigation technology. Do you mind just moving on, Jamie? Thanks. So let me just explain and show you what I mean about this backbone infrastructure for, for the Scottish cluster. So um, ACORN is one of the UK's most advanced carbon capture and storage and hydrogen projects. It's based right in the heart of the oil and gas industry on the northeast coast of Scotland. And the location is really quite a strategic one. We're based at a place called St Fergus, at the at gas terminal at St Fergus. And we're based there because it gives us access to existing offshore pipelines that were used for uh, bringing natural gas onshore, but they can be reused for taking CO2 offshore. And these pipes give us access to you've heard multiple times now today, this really excellent storage resource, this excellent geological storage resource that we have in the North Sea um, off the, the coast of Scotland. And the ACORN project has, um, has been quite far advanced. So I think back in 2018, if my memory serves me correctly, we, we had our um, license um, starting to get underway for the ACORN CO2 storage site. And that's the, the first kind of site that you can see there on, on the map with the pipelines leading directly in, into that site. And that is a, it's a really critical part of this project. And when we talk, you heard Mike talk about infrastructure reuse and, and having a lot of um, really good access to data for that geological site. And all of that helps us to be able to deliver this project by the, the mid 2020s. So to actually have a carbon capture and storage, full chain, large scale carbon capture and storage project running in that time scale and the access to all of this existing infrastructure and this knowledge and understanding of that store is is what allows us uh, to do that and to to work speedily um, on that and um, you can see from the the slide here that what we are looking to do is, is start with a uh, carbon dioxide emissions existing carbon dioxide emissions from the st fergus gas terminal itself and build that up so that we would be um dealing with between five to ten million tons of co2 every year by 2030. And that really is a, a significant volume of, of CO2 when you think about globally how much CO2 is being captured um, at the moment. It's, it is a pretty significant ramp up and it, it shows you just the, the volume of CO2 that can be stored in, in this North Sea um, storage resource. And I mentioned that, you know, we're this sort of we're providing this backbone infrastructure and this carbon capture and storage project is this backbone infrastructure. That we talk about it being a sort of catalyst for clean growth. And that is all because at that St. Fergus gas terminal site, there's a, a fantastic opportunity for blue hydrogen production. So that's hydrogen production from natural gas. Um, there is about 35% of natural gas that's used in the UK at the moment is, um, is brought in and processed at the St. Fergus gas terminal. And what the, the carbon capture and storage project for ACORN allows us to do is to, um, to establish a, a hydrogen generation hub at St Fergus, where we can create hydrogen from the natural gas and manage that CO2, deal with that CO2 through our, our ACORN CCS system. Also in the very nearby area, we've got access to the deep water port at Peterhead, um, which allows us to uh, provide a service for CO2 import facilities, as you heard from, from Mike. Um, you know, the Pizer Headport is the one that's local to the, the ACORN project, but there are ports along the coast of Scotland and the coast in the UK. And this is 
you know, for, from a CCSA cluster perspective, this is a real huge opportunity to be able to develop these ports so that they can allow the, the import of CO2 to, to be allow us to access this great storage opportunity. Um, and also to help uh, regions which don't have access to easy access to CO2 uh, storage opportunities to, to be able to decarbonize. Um, and then finally, the Mike has, has already alluded to this idea that because of establishing this, the CCS infrastructure, it opens up a, a whole world of possibilities for these other low carbon and carbon removal um, opportunities, such as direct air capture and um, BECS as well. Um, and there's been some announcements today around some direct air capture uh, opportunities that we as a company are, are, are looking to develop in this, in this Northeast coast because we, we have um, hopefully got this access to the ACORN CCS uh, system. So hugely exciting um, opportunity. If you don't mind just moving on, uh, Jamie, I think this is coming to my last slide. No, second last. So yeah, I just wanted to explain just in a little bit more detail. Um, I mentioned about being able to be operational by the mid 2020s. Um, basically we can do that because what we're, we're looking to do with our carbon capture and storage project is capture these existing emissions at the St. Fergus gas terminal and use that one of the existing pipelines, one of the three existing pipelines that we, we know is suitable for reuse for CO2 um, transportation. And it's the GoldenEye pipeline taken straight out to that Acorn CO2 storage site. Um, the, the site that we are looking to start storing our, our CO2 in um, is one that has been really well developed in the past because of previous CO2 um, transportation and storage projects that have been investigated in this region. So we've got very, very high degree of confidence in, in those stores. Um, and that allows us to um, establish that very large scale infrastructure and get access to, to the, the transportation and storage and very quickly scale up. So being able to quickly bring on additional pipelines and additional storage sites. And there is work ongoing um, internally at the moment because we can see the, the interest in, in the availability of transportation and storage um, to actually build out and, and look at further storage um, site options uh, for, for the ACORN project. If you don't mind moving on, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, so this is just to, to summarise. Um, I had mentioned uh, about the, the hydrogen project, the ACORN hydrogen project. Um, because of this uh, easy access to, to natural gas, um, the Acorn Hydrogen Project, what we are planning on doing is starting with a, a 200 megawatt hydrogen uh, production plant. Um, it's a really, really scalable solution and we're looking to scale as, um, as to meet demand um, at, St. Ferg at St. Fergus. Um, the, real, the real key about that is that at the St. Fergus site, we've got access to uh, the national transmission system, which is with sort of the very large scale system where um, natural gas goes, goes down through the country. Um, we have an opportunity to blend um, hydrogen within that, that national transmission system, which would help to decarbonize that whole system. Um, but also there, it means that we've got um, a, a backup system for when we're looking um, to create that really create the excitement and generate that hydrogen market in the Northeast and look at people who would be interested in 100% hydrogen um, solutions. But having the combination of those two things really helps us with the, the financing and the scalability of, of these projects. We, we are looking at a, a very scalable project. So, you know, anything up to um, a gigawatt of hydrogen generation by 2030. Um, so really exciting and it's it's really important about uh, establishing this kind of large scale hydrogen market to create that wider interest and excitement in hydrogen to allow um, green hydrogen generation to come in um, and, and tap into to these, these markets as well. Um, a final piece that has been touched on already by Andy and Mike is that um, decarbonizing Scotland's industry. So in the, the sort of central belt area of Scotland, you can see on that map, we've got, we've got Grangemouth highlighted. That's the, the sort of real industrial emissions uh, piece uh, within Scotland. Um, we, we are looking for the ACORN CO2 transportation and storage solution to, to provide um, the, the CO2 solution for that uh, industrial decarbonization process at the central belt. 
And you can see here that we've got 90% of Scotland's large site emissions are within 50 kilometres of this onshore natural gas pipeline that can be reused for, for CO2 transportation. So another really exciting opportunity. And the, the Peterhead port that I mentioned um, is just eight miles from the St Fergus gas terminal, which opens up this, uh, this opportunity for a CO2 import from around the UK and Europe um, as well. And then just the, the final point on the, the store, you, you heard some really impressive figures from Mike already. And the one that we tend to, to talk about is that 30% of the UK's CO2 storage lies just within 50 kilometres of those, um, those three St Fergus uh, pipeline corridors and um, those offshore pipelines that go uh, to the to the stores um, in the in the central North Sea. So a really exciting, um, really exciting project that we are just uh, desperate to get to get going with um, and and hopefully to unlock all of these great opportunities that you've been hearing to to create this cluster effect within Scotland that we can really make a dent on our, our carbon dioxide emissions and our industrial emissions in particular. Uh, Jimmy, I think it's just a, a thank you slide for me at the end. Lovely. Well, Kirsty, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm conscious we're running a little bit behind time, so I'm just going to jump uh, straight to audience uh, questions, if that's OK. I've been uh, just taking a look at some of those. I've seen we, we have several questions in, in relation to jobs. Um, just, I guess, to, to summarise those, what skills are needed to deliver the ACORN project and indeed the wider net zero roadmap? I'll perhaps ask you to respond to that first, Kirsty, and, and then Mike, if you'd like to come in. Sure. So, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole concept of this energy transition is CCS and hydrogen are, are really pillars of, of that energy transition and I mentioned that this project takes place in the sort of heart of the oil and gas industry and there's you know, wide, widespread recognition that the oil and gas industry um, is, is in transition and these uh, roles that are provided by these projects are very suited to that um, to the, that sector, a transition of that sector, because you know the the skills and and the knowledge that's required to work offshore, and um, the engineering and of gas handling, all of these things are really directly comparable to to that oil and gas um, sector. And also, you know, the it's it's not just about the creation of new jobs um, within that low carbon energy space. It's about preservation of of existing jobs by allowing are sort of are really a, are heavy emitting industries, um, the ability to decarbonize and to to exist in an in a net zero environment that is about preserving the, the the jobs that exist within those industries and you know that's that is just as important as as the new the new job creation that's allowed by by these pretty substantial infrastructure projects as well. Right. Mike, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, ju just to highlight that uh, I think, you know, we're, we're increasingly thinking about two phasing of jobs. Uh, there's the construction phase and, and there, you know, when you look at individual projects, you quite quickly get to sort of, you know, a thousand, a thousand or so jobs for a large uh, decarbonizing project. You know, several projects acting together uh, as part of a cluster, you quickly get to sort of five to 10,000 jobs in that construction phase. Um, but perhaps just as interesting is the longer term operational jobs. And whilst they're potentially lower, you know, you may be looking at a couple of thousand rather than tens of thousands, you know, they are jobs that, you know, uh, are evergreen, uh, tend to be highly skilled, tend to be highly paid. And then lastly, the supply chain that you engage to do this, um, though their skills, uh, their knowledge is something that then the rest of the globe will want to tie into. You know, they, the, whoever's had knowledge of first of a kind projects where that learning can be shared, uh, whoever has the understanding as to how to deliver uh, these uh, projects within a certain regulatory regime, and that regulatory regime is likely to be similar across most of the Western world, at least, uh, has a leg up when it comes to you know, using those resources elsewhere in the world. And I think even so, follow on question, Mike. Of course. Sorry, I was just going to ask do you think there might be an export opportunity in the future? Uh, 
Yes, I do. And, and in fact, uh, Nexus is working with a, a, a Bayes, the, the, um, uh, the sort of industrial uh, department uh, for the UK government, uh, and with the CCSA, which is uh, the UK-wide uh, CCS Association, to look at this. We think there are significant opportunities here. Um, we think the export opportunities are likely to be, uh, for the UK at least, uh, in high value manufacturing of, of some of the key components. Uh, and particularly if we can move that from, from fabricating components, which has traditionally been uh, the approach that has been used in the oil and gas sector offshore into the manufacturing of these components. And that fits with the idea of standardization and modularization. Uh, but we also see uh, the actual uh, design and engineering integration, which is something that Scotland and the oil and gas industry in Scotland has traditionally done for projects around the globe. Uh, we can almost directly port that experience and skill base into this area. That's great, thank you. Um, we've received several questions regarding the storage facility that will be used for ACORN. Um, in particular, people are interested in understanding whether uh, you're planning to use depleted gas fields or, or saline aquifers. Could you perhaps answer that question, Kirsty? Sure, so our starting point um, that I mentioned to get us kick-started in by the mid-2020s is using um, it's new new wells being drilled um, and it's in a, a former uh, it's, it's in a saline aquifer but it's in a former um, gas reservoir site so it's it's using the the golden eye site that has been previously uh, there's been a huge amount of, of work done on on previous uh, projects previous iterations of CCS projects in the UK um, but the the real so the whole of that acorn uh, CO2 storage site is a is a very large um, aquifer uh, base that there's there's multiple opportunities for for storage um, beyond beyond those um, those sites that you know there's there's sand, it's sandstone that we can uh, tap into there and the the wider CO2 uh, storage opportunity uh, around there's it's is looking at a uh, saline aquifer sites that's the, the where you get to those very large volumes of, of CO2 storage. That's great. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, we've received a, a few questions in relation to business and commercial models. Um, just reading out uh, Colin Smith's question here. So has a, has a commercial model been established for ACORN? Is government subsidy anticipated to be a key part of the funding? Um, so it, it's it's ongoing. Um, I mentioned that we are right in the midst of uh, the cluster sequencing um, bid process. Um, so there there will be an element of government subsidy for these initial CCS clusters for all for all of the the initial UK CCS clusters. Um, I think the thing which is really exciting, and I've I've worked on at least three or four a uh, different carbon capture and storage projects and what I've seen evolve over time is um, the, the private investment interest. Um, and I, I think that's absolutely critical is, is bringing that, um, that commercialization uh, to carbon capture and storage and hydrogen um, and some of the other low carbon technologies that we've been, been talking about. Um, this initial phase in the UK will have an element of, of public subsidy, but um, the, the ambition is to move as as quickly as possible um, on to to try and and a uh, commercialize this this opportunity. Okay, great. Um, we've received some questions about uh, CO two shipping and and specifically whether Scotland might be able to accept CO two from other parts of uh, Europe. I don't know if you'd like to answer that question initially, Mike, and then maybe Andy, you have some views on that. Uh, sure, I, th I think you know the um, the North Sea facing countries. Uh, you know, they have a uh, you know, a common, I think, objective to try and put the most resilient carbon capture and storage infrastructure in place as possible. Uh, and yet, each of you know, some of those countries, uh, Germany is a good example, doesn't have the natural geology. Uh, and other countries, uh, you know, the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, they potentially only have one or two sites. Um, you know, there is far more industrial emissions uh, in those nations than maybe their natural stores can accommodate. Uh, and if we want to build a resilient set of stores, uh, we need to be able to interchange where the carbon is taken to because you know, no single store will necessarily be available 365 days a year 
there will inevitably be downtimes. So I do think that Scotland offers a fantastic opportunity to take uh, CO2, particularly from Northwest Europe and those North Sea facing countries. Um, we did some analysis and found uh, across the seven North Sea facing countries, there is approximately 440 million tons of CO2 emissions per annum from industry. Yeah, there really is only two places that can start to handle that at scale, that's Scotland and our neighbors across the water in Norway. Andy, anything to add? Yeah, I think Mike's picked a key point here, which is I think that the, the, the amount of CO2 in Europe is going to vastly outweigh the, the size of the stores in the short term. That there is lots of carbon to be captured. So this, I don't think this is a, a, an issue for competition. This is very much one that developing stores in collaboration is absolutely the model to go for. It builds resilience and it will build a market over time. Um, and I think for government, that, that presents some uh, interesting problems, that, the types of problems that government should be there to fix. So things like the infrastructure challenges associated with that, the regulatory frameworks around that, and the, the, the collaboration between countries. So from Scottish government's perspective, um, multiple countries developing stores is, is exactly the sort of model we'd want to see. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Andy, Mike, Kirsty, thank you so much for the insight that you've shared today. I'm conscious that we're uh, rapidly running out of time, so I think we'll have to, to leave it there now. Thank you very much for your presentations. I will just move across to our closing slide. Um, today, Andy told us about Scotland's plans to deliver net zero by 2045 and the importance of CCS to that. CCS is vital to reaching net zero emissions by the middle of the century. Um, Mike spoke about the various industrial sites within Scotland's net zero roadmap. CCS is the only technology able to decarbonize hard to abate industry. For some emission sources, there really are no credible alternatives to CCS. Kirsty told us about the ACORN project and its plans to reuse pipeline infrastructure. There are many projects around the world which are finding new ways to drive deployment costs down. CCS is cost effective and costs continue to decrease with further deployment. If you'd like to learn more about CCS, you can follow the Institute on social media for regular updates. Visit our website to access uh, both the recording of today's webinar and our various publications, including our flagship global status of CCS report. Uh, and finally, you can access our core database where you'll find details of operational CCS facilities around the world and those in development. A final thanks to our speakers today. We really appreciate the insight that you've been able to share. And thanks to you, our audience, for your interest in uh, CCS deployment there in Scotland. We hope that you have a great day. Thank you very much.